Hello viewers, I am Dr. Rubiul. I work as a lecturer in pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is Marfan syndrome part 2. This video will contain brief discussion about the clinical features, diagnosis and management of Marfan syndrome. Okay, a lot of topics, so let's begin. So first, we will talk about the clinical features. Recall from the previous video of this series that Marfan syndrome particularly involves the skeletal system, the cardiovascular system, and our eyes. We also have to remember one important thing, that is the clinical features of Marfan syndrome are variable. For example, in some individuals with Marfan syndrome, skeletal abnormalities may be the most striking feature, whereas in some other individuals with Marfan syndrome, cardiovascular manifestations may be prominent and they may have minimal changes in their skeletal system or in their eyes. Now, you may be asking me, Dr. Robiu, why is there such variation in the clinical features? It is believed that the variation is due to the various types of mutations that may happen in the FBN1 gene that is responsible for Marfan syndrome. For example, in the ninth edition of your textbook, you will see that it is written that more than 600 distinct types of mutations have been discovered that can happen in the FBN1 gene. And in the latest edition or 10th edition of your textbook that came out a few months ago, you will see that it is written that more than 1800 distinct types of mutations have been discovered in the FBN1 gene. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that due to the various types of mutations that can happen in FBN1 gene, the clinical features are also variable. So what are the skeletal abnormalities that we can see in an individual with Marfan syndrome? The individuals may be unusually tall with abnormally long extremities. The fingers and toes of the individuals may be long and tapering and this is also called arachnodactyly. The arm span may be greater than the height. Now we measure arm span by asking the patient to stretch their arms to the side and then we measure the distance from fingertip to opposite fingertip. Now, in a normal individual, the arm span length is roughly the same as the height of the individual. But in case of an individual with Marfan syndrome, the arm span length may be greater than the height. Similarly, in an individual with Marfan syndrome, there will be reduced ratio between the upper segment and lower segment. That means the torso will be abnormally shorter when compared to the legs. Individuals with Marfan syndrome may have hypermobile joints. The joint ligaments of hand and feet are lax and the thumb can be hyperextended back to the wrist. Since they have hypermobile joints, they may have difficulty in doing certain tasks. For example, they may have difficulty in holding a pen or pencil. Moving on to their head, you can see as shown in the image, an individual with Marfan syndrome may have elongated head. There may be bossing in the frontal eminence and they may also have prominent supraorbital ridges. Moving on to the vertebral column, you can see that individuals with Marfan syndrome may have deformity there. For example, they may have kyphosis, scoliosis, kyphoscoliosis, etc.
They may also have chest deformities, for example, the sternum may be deeply depressed and that is also called pectus excavatum. In other cases, the chest may be protruding outwards and th that is also called pigeon breast deformity. Moving on to the eyes, what will be the clinical features in their eyes? They will have bilateral dislocation of their lens and it is also referred as ectopia lentis. And as a matter of fact, this thing is happening due to weakening of the suspensory ligaments that used to suspend the lens of our eyes. And usually the dislocation happens outwards and upwards. So there is bilateral dislocation or subluxation of lens and it is usually occurring upwards and outwards. And as a matter of fact, this finding is highly specific for Marfan syndrome. So whenever the physician has found such finding, the physician may suspect that it is a case of Marfan syndrome. Individuals with Marfan syndrome will have cardiovascular abnormalities. They may have problem in their mitral valve. The valve leaflets may become soft and billowy and the corda tendini may become elongated. All these things will lead to floppy valve syndrome and mitral regurgitation. Individuals with Marfan syndrome may have problem in their aorta. They may have aortic aneurysm or dilation of the aorta and this is clinically more important because aortic aneurysm may rupture and sometimes tunica intima is teared and blood enters into the tunica media and cleaves tunica media as we discussed in the previous video and that was called aortic dissection. So in the aorta there may be dilation of the aorta that is called aortic aneurysm. There may be also dissection of the aorta that is called aortic dissection and the problem is aortic aneurysm or aortic dissection may rupture and that may have fatal consequences. That's why proper monitoring and management of an individual with Marfan syndrome is very important. So now that we have talked about the major clinical features of Marfan syndrome, now we will move on and talk about the diagnosis of Marfan syndrome. Now the diagnosis of Marfan syndrome is based on the 2010 revised Ghent criteria that rely on seven rules to diagnose a case of Marfan syndrome. In the absence of family history of Marfan syndrome, four rules are used and in the presence of family history, other three rules are implied. Now, since this is beyond the scope of pathology, so we will just have an overview about the seven rules. So, in the absence of family history, four rules are used and the first rule is when the aortic root dilation z-score is two or more than two and at the same time the individual has ectopia lentis, the case is diagnosed as a case of Marfan syndrome. The second rule is when the individual's aortic root dilation z-score is two or more than two and at the same time the individual also has FBN1 mutation, then that is also diagnosed as a case of Marfan syndrome. The third rule implies that the individual's aortic root dilation Z score is two or more than two, and at the same time, systemic score that is calculated by measuring certain systemic features, the systemic score is 7 or more than 7. And when these two things are coexisting, that is the aortic root dilation Z score is 2 or more than 2 and at the same time the systemic score is calculated 7 or more than 7, the individual is also diagnosed as a case of Marfan syndrome. The fourth rule implies that 
when the individual has ectopia lentis and at the same time the individual has FBN1 mutation that previously was associated with an aortic disease then the individual will be also diagnosed as a case of Marfan syndrome despite the absence of aortic root dilation. So these four rules were implied in the absence of family history of Marfan syndrome. When the individual gives family history of Marfan syndrome, the other three rules are used. So in the presence of family history, when the individual has ectopia lentis plus presence of family history, then that case may be also diagnosed as a case of Marfan syndrome. When the individual's systemic score is 7 or more than 7 and at the same time the individual also gives family history of Marfan syndrome, that is also diagnosed as a case of Marfan syndrome. The third rule in presence of family history of Marfan syndrome is that when the individual's aortic root dilation Z score is 2 or more than 2 when the individual's age is more than 20 years or if the individual's aortic root dilation Z score is 3 or more than 3 and the age of the individual is less than 20 years and at the same time there is also family history of Marfan syndrome then that case is also diagnosed as Marfan syndrome. So this was in short regarding the revised Ghent criteria of diagnosing a case of Marfan syndrome. So now that we have talked about the diagnosis of Marfan syndrome, now we will move on and talk about the management of Marfan syndrome. Now there is no cure for Marfan syndrome, however treatments are available that can reduce or prevent many of the complications of Marfan syndrome. Recall that dilation of the ascending aorta or ascending aortic aneurysm may be a big problem for individuals with Marfan syndrome. Medications can be used to slow the rate of such aortic dilation. For example, beta blockers can reduce the strain on the aorta and by doing so, they can slow the rate of aortic dilation. If the individual encounters side effects with beta blocker, for example, if the individual encounters nausea or tiredness, other medication can be used, for example, calcium channel blockers may be prescribed instead in those situations. Recall that Overactivation of transforming growth factor beta had important roles in many of the pathogenesis of Marfan syndrome. That's why certain medications like losartan can be used because losartan can block the action of transforming growth factor beta. Now, if the aortic aneurysm is growing rapidly, surgery may be recommended after evaluating the age of the patient and also after evaluating the overall medical condition of the patient. Again, if the individual is showing features of aortic dissection, for example, if the individual is showing sudden severe tearing chest pain, surgery may also be recommended. Now the surgeon will decide what type of surgery will be required after evaluating the patient. If the aortic valve of the patient is working properly, the surgeon will recommend a surgery that is called aortic valve sparing surgery. In this type of surgery, the aortic valve will be spared that means it won't be replaced but only the dilated segment of the aorta will be replaced by a graft. If the individual's aortic valve is not working properly then the surgeon will recommend a surgery that is called composite valve grafting. In that type of surgery the aortic valve will be replaced by an artificial valve and also the dilated portion of the aorta will also be replaced by a 
graft. Now, if composite valve surgery was performed, the individual should take lifelong blood thinners or anticoagulant medication to prevent the risk of thrombosis. If the individual's surgery was valve sparing surgery, the individual may have to take anticoagulant therapy or blood thinner therapy for a short duration, but not lifelong. And the surgeon may also recommend to continue the other medications that the individual was taking before surgery. Now recall that in Marfan syndrome, the individual may also have problem in their vertebra and if that problem is severe and compressing the heart or lungs, surgery may be required. In other cases, braces may be used to prevent further complication from those deformities. Recall that individuals with Marfan syndrome also has problem in their eyes, so glasses or contact lenses may be used to correct those problems and sometimes surgery may be also recommended. Now individuals with Marfan syndrome may also develop dural ectasia. Recall that dura is the outermost layer of meninges that covers our brain and spinal cord and in dural ectasia that dura becomes stretched and weakened. In case of dural ectasia, pain medication may be used for management of that condition. So this was in short about the management of Marfan syndrome and this concludes our video on Marfan syndrome. I hope this video was helpful. If you like my videos, do comment, share, subscribe and let me know. And for my students, I will also recommend you to go through your textbooks to know more information. Okay, that's all for today. Until next time, take care and stay blessed. Thank you.